The new Nissan Pulsar is today on Auto Gefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars. It has been in 2006 when the Almera, the predecessor of this car, was cancelled and Nissan was leaving rather the compact segment, especially in Europe. And now they are back here in the compact class with the Nissan Pulsar. This name has been used before, now it has returned with this very vehicle and in our full review we're going to examine everything about the exterior interior and the driving of this very car middle trim level a center it is called this test vehicle is specced with and the 1.2 liter turbo engine so let's go now with auto fuel in full hd full screen and full length let's go When we take a look at the front, the Nissan Pulsar draws a friendly face, almost smiling a little bit, and we got modern, sharply designed headlights, but nothing spectacular, especially. And this is already starting to call a theme of the car, because this car doesn't want to arouse too much attention. And the same accounts for the side profile, 17 inch alloys we have here right now and they're a good choice because they're already big enough for the car, already give you some quite nice design and you don't need to go any bigger there because maybe lose comfort with bigger alloys. Then the side profile you see that the dropping line is stepping up a little bit towards the rear, 4 meters 38 of the total length of this car and I think it has a little bit of a compact van layout, don't you think so as well? Put me your reactions to this one in the comments definitely and the van style will be repeated in the interior a little bit i can promise you already right now to top this design up by the way there's also a design package called nissan design studio and then for example you can get orange alloys in the room that looks pretty spectacular and if we take a look at the rear here, this is the most daring part of the car because the design here is rather joyful, a little bit round and you, for example, see also some resemblance to the Nissan Juke, I think. What do you think about that thought, guys? Um, you see this you know, bulky rear lights, horizontal drawn around the side and then this part is also quite bulky. Very interesting design on the rear, definitely. It's not my favorite. I can tell you so far, is it yours? Then put me that one in the comments. Well, that's very nice as well here, that we got some carbon style diffuser at the lower part. That is daring for a car that is not that sporty. Let's get inside. This is the key, but you can also use the keyless function here. It's closing and opening it right here. Easy entry, the door opens quite wide. And seating position is not really high for compact car, but also not low. It's pretty standard, I would say. The seats. We'll soon show you the surface in detail. It's a closed surface because we don't have the highest trim level here, so never go for the very highest trim level because then you possibly land, uh, land up with leather. Um, so the seat surface is very good, but the seat form, well, for tall people, I'm 1 meters 86 in height, and I can already tell you so far when I'm going very long motorways, um, a couple of hours, then I'm getting a little bit of, you know, back fatigue in the lumbar area, so that's not the best for the very long rides. For normal city rides and stuff and the normal everyday use, they will do just fine. But I didn't have 
the best experience for longer rides. Also the position, if you check out the steering wheel, this is everything pretty normal and standard for a compact car. Well, the windscreen, it has a little bit kind of a panoramic style um, because as I've told you with the exterior, this car has a little bit of a van style and that's also repeated here a little bit in the interior. We got a leatherette on the inside of the doors with some contrast stitches. Then the buttons for the windows, they don't look too classy. Maybe they could work on that to give it a little bit more quality. Then here now check out the seats with the surface. This is a quite interesting surface also with contrast stitches in white. Nicely done on the visual part and also there's another seat material than here that feels quite soft. That is nice. And the steering wheel is a standard Nissan steering wheel and look at it and someone just told me hey it looks a little bit like a head of an elephant and as soon as so somebody tells you that you always see it sorry you do now as well sorry if i've spoiled it for you storage spaces the one at the inside of the doors is not quite big but it can handle a bigger bottle then a standard glove box no cooling function available and in the front, near the ignition button, there's some small space, for example, for smartphone and stuff. Then the seat heating buttons are placed right here. You can always leave that on, by the way. So if you just leave that button, then you always have with high seat heating or low seat heating. That's a nice solution as well. Beverage holders, they differ in size. And then the middle armrest, there's a USB slot hidden beneath that one and last but not least there's also a very small space for your glasses up there in the ceiling. This is the cockpit overview. Nice we also got some sunlight here now. I'm getting in for you for an overview explanation. And well what do we see? First of all the middle console it's coming quite close towards you so it's not like very straight comes right in again um, it serves a little bit the fact that it has some van elements to me on the outside and on the inside very nice thing you see here the most attractive element is this one here and it's called cubic print this is not real wood but it has a real wood styling and it also feels better than normal plastic, it feels also wood-like, so very well done here. To put something high class in here, which is not very, you know, stressing up the price. We got a higher trim level here, but not the highest one. Of course, they differ from market to market, but it's always a good choice, I think, to go for a rather middle trim level, because it's the best price-performance ratio usually, and as I said earlier, the highest trimmers are usually combined with leather seats, which we don't want to have anymore. The screen is rather small, we will soon go into detail on that screen here. The AC, AC unit, everything is you know pretty simple, so you get along with this car very fastly. You don't have to learn any, anything. Standard shifting here, talking about more about the manual gearbox when we drive the car, of course. And the elephant <laughs> steering wheel, you know, do you see it now? Really funny thing. And you've got controls on the steering wheel, uh, right side for example for the phone, cruise control, set the speed, cancel, and the left part is for uh, you know controlling the sound volume, scrolling another sound when you have your phone, we have Bluetooth connected, and also here is the control for the middle part of the instruments, here for the digital part of that one. And to the cockpit in detail, you see on the right side speedometer, left side RPM. In the middle one, we have a digital screen. And as I told you earlier, the left part of the steering wheel is here to control that one. You can see the digital speed then, but also go through the tripometer or the consumption and stuff. As I said, about 7 liters, a little bit below that even on one kilometer, with a 1.2 liter turbo petrol engine. Compass here available as well, and also Bluetooth audio information if you have your smartphone connected, that works very easy. And also for the assistance systems, there are some stuff. And yes, from the government <coughs> requested now, also 
the tire pressure. And the infotainment system special. First, let's start in detail with the AC unit. You see, as I said, it's very easy to control, very big buttons, and um, so you don't have to get used to it. Mode from where the winds are coming from kept pretty simple. Then the infotainment screen, you can put it brighter or this dark mode, you know, when driving at night. It's a good thing that you have a shortcut for it. You can have it also on auto mode or put up the brightness now that you can see it best. Even now with a little bit sunlight coming in, it's hard to see then, um, even at full brightness. You can switch to the camera mode at all times. You can see the left part is normal rear camera and the right part is the fake drone view from above from the around cameras, front, rear, side, side, each mount at the side mirrors. I can tell you that uh, when you're driving the car, when I'm going out of the parking box, then you can see that one in action. It's quite, of, it's quite small and not the best resolution. It's great to have it in a compact segment with the higher trim levels or optionally, but still they could work on the resolution and maybe the screen at all could be bigger. Then the GPS, it's simple, the visualization, but the good thing is they have really worked on the reaction time. It doesn't take so much time to put in a new address or something like that. For example, when, you're, when I want to put in a new city as address, see Berlin, it works quite fast and see also, um, let's see, maybe go to Platz der Republik, that's where the German Bundestag is, the parliament. See, I automatically realize it and okay. So how fast the GPS is calculating, you can see it right here. And I'm quite content with that one. They have really worked on that one. It's not a real, very fancy system, but you get everything you need basically. Also when you switch to the phone function, you can easily connect a phone via Bluetooth. That works pretty fast as well. Let's get in the rear and well, I think this car doesn't have, you know, so many outstanding features. It's everywhere in a kind of standard level. But this one, this is the outstanding level. It's the rear knee space. Nissan says they have the best space here in the whole segment. And I think they're right with this. Look at that. The seat is as I would be driving. So rather tall driver and look at that one here so much knee space in front of me wow i mean we're still in the compact segment the car is not really long it's not the longest car in the compact segment and this is kind of knee space we sometimes have you know in a upper mid-size class or something like that and that's really astonishing so if you're going with tall people in the back here quite often then this is the main factor to go for this car along with a good price performance ratio, you know, when we take a look at what you get for a trim level at what price. We don't have a panoramic roof here. If I lean back, well, the headspace is a little bit still left above my head with 1 meter 86 meters. So the headspace is not that good than the, than the knee space, but still quite reasonable. And you sit rather upright here in the rear, and that's another good thing. So rear passenger comfort is the best for this car. Flipping the seats is already possible from here, but we can also do it from the trunk. And there we are. The hatch looks ooh, pretty unusual, but then you see there's a very wide opening and that is great. Better than in some of, of some real estates. <laughs> I mean real estates, not real estate. So, and then I can easily remove the top cover here. Underneath that one, and um, well, one solution would be just to put it here below there, or just leave it at home, whatever. And then you can see how much space we have. It goes a little bit in there here, um, but that's reasonable space for a compact car. Even uh, well, quite much already, I have to say. And the flipping levers I've shown you earlier. You can also put that one from the from the boot here and then you see you already got a very long space because in the combination with the long leg room and then there's a trick because well it's unfortunately not possible to flip the front seat totally to the front so that you've seen it just that was the maximum but you can slide it 
pretty far to the front. That is possible then. And if you look at that here now, and going from the front seat there, all the way to the back, I've measured it before, it's about 190 in meters. And that means, and I've also tested that, you can put a big mountain bike in here if you remove the front tire and then you put the back of the mountain bike in there and the, um, you know, the, the front here, the, the handlebars in the front and you know the left out front tire somewhere else. So, and that leads us to the aspect that the Nissan Pulsar compact car hatch can almost be used like a little bit bigger estate station wagon or combi as we say in Germany. And that, I think, is a good result combination to the good legroom in the rear. That one is another good thing. It's a good package. You have a lot of space on the inside, although the car is not that huge on the outside. So what's beneath the hood? First of all, it's quite funny when you open it and you said, oh, how to uh, put it up here with, with a stick. Um, yeah, that's behind here. <laughs> that's it. So. Um, it's a quite open engine layout. You see there's no real cover above it. And this one here is a 1.2 liter petrol engine with 115 horsepower, six speed manual transmission, or there's also an automatic gearbox available for this one. For the other ones, not. There's also a 1.6 liter petrol engine available with 190 horsepower. That's way more power. But this one here will be sufficient. It's not the, really the racing engine, but it will be sufficient. And on the diesel side, 1.5 liter diesel with 110 horsepower. Even that one has a little bit more torque than, than this one here, of course, because you know, when diesel and petrol engines have the same amount of horsepower, the diesel always has more torque. Welcome to the driving part, starting the engine. And then you can also see the 360 degree camera in action. So, and soon, so go to the reverse, you see here the, the gear, you put that thing here up and then go into the reverse on the left. And then we got this split, left side the normal review camera, on the right side I can really see how I'm going out this parking box here. And the good thing is I can also see the pavement so I don't damage anything from the alloys. And I can also see when I can turn in the steering wheel that I don't hit the other car standing next to me. So a very good thing, but you know, as I said earlier, it's a little bit small with the screen and also the resolution is not the best one. I forgot to release the handbrake. That's by the way a good thing for the automatic handbrakes. When you put them in auto hold, they automatically release and you never forget to release them. That's also the reason why I forgot that now for a second, because I've recently driven almost every car with an automatic handbrake. However, you also know maybe that I'm usually arguing for the manual handbrakes, as this is something, you know, when it's really manual, something for the last resort. If everything from the electronics fail and maybe you, you're losing some uh, braking pressure or whatever could possibly happen, then it would still be possible just to pull the normal manual handbrake. That's why usually in favor of that one, but just thinking of a you know, practical side, when nothing is failing, then the automatic handbrakes would usually be better. The 1.2 liter turbo petrol engine we are driving here right now, the smallest one that is available, at least here in Germany, and I told you earlier, there's also the 1.6 liter petrol engine turbo and um, also the diesel with 110 horsepower. Well, which one you should go for? I'm testing the small petrol engine now and the first thought, uh, is that really enough? Yeah, it is. It is. It's really enough. I mean, if I'm accelerating here now in the city, well, it's no speed miracle. Definitely not, no. It's still okay. I mean, you got sufficient power for the city. Can't complain that you know I'm not getting getting this car going when I'm starting at the traffic light or something. And even on the motorway, we'll come to a motorway part later on. We'll start with city driving right now, but I've already uh, scored some 
a couple of hundreds kilometers on the motorway as well. And there I can also say due to the turbo, even if you're like in fixed gear and driving 120 kilometers an hour and maybe want to accelerate to 140, 150, still it does work. I mean, as I said, not very high speed wise, but it does work. So when you ask me, is this engine here sufficient for this car? Yes, it is. And of course you can save money because there's a lower entry price and you can, for example, also save some fuel because as I said, I've driven a couple of hundred kilometers with this car here now and in the middle screen I can switch it on the left side of the steering wheel. Consumption in the city and motorway mix 6.9 liters, so almost 7 liters on 100 kilometers and I think that's, that's quite okay. I mean, we we had a lot of cars that are using much more fuel, even with small engines. Of course, we had also some more efficient ones, but this one is, I think, scoring quite well in this respect. So the left part on the steering wheel, as I said, to control the middle digital instrument cluster. Usually I have it on the digital speedometer because, you know, that's quite big and you can easily see it if you compare it for example to the to the analog speedometer here you can directly see the digit number and so you can um, adjust for example to speed cran cameras and stuff so the height of the ac control is also quite good so when i'm controlling it while driving as you see as a very short way from the steering wheel to the ac unit i like that some cars have it placed you know, too far below there. We see, for example, in the Volkswagen Caddy or also in the Mercedes A-Class, it was placed too far below there. With the infotainment screen while driving, yeah, I mentioned it, it's quite small, but there's some good stuff to change, for example, to day and night view, um, so it's quite bright here already, so this in night view can see nothing, and then you can put up the brightness, also change it here again, and then you can adjust to every driving situation, definitely. About the sound insulation, I think it's in a, you know, at the standard level. Not really astonishing, but not bad. And I've also tested it with a DB meter app on the smartphone, so when standing still, it's about 52, 53 dB. I've also recently, recently did it in the Volkswagen Tiguan that was a little, little few DB numbers below that and also while driving it is, you know, this here, the automatic traffic information. I, I don't really like that. I don't want to be surprised by the automatic traffic information. Usually you can deactivate those inside the menus, but it's quite often that it's very hidden deep inside the menus and that gets really annoying to, to search for that. It's, that's really, really dumb. So back to the dB meter. When driving, it was above 70 dB, 72, 73 dB. So also, if you compare it again to the Tiguan, a little bit louder. But that was, you know, no real surprise. Being stuck in traffic, the engine is quite silent. Especially because it's a small petrol engine, so the installation to the engine is quite good. And from shifting, there's no real hard resistance, but it's still not feeling too loose. So I think they have found a good compromise for the manual shifting box here. Um, you can also go with an automatic gearbox with, uh, with this and that's possible, but this one also does just fine. So, And it fits a little bit to the stuff I've told you before when talking about the car in general. This guy is not really standing out in certain things. Maybe I'll, maybe one, you know, with a with a rear space. It's kind of everywhere in you know, in, in the middle middle field. So not totally great. It's somewhere here, but but also no not bad at all. You know, so really solid. Everything works just fine, and that's also feeling here. What do I? Mean? You see that? That's what I mean. It's really annoying. Because it uh, again it knows it is a traffic info, 
Well, maybe sometimes it can be quite useful, but usually I'm um, rather annoyed by this. Also, from the clutch and pressing um, the throttle, you know, that's also important when being in traffic. Is it hard to press the clutch? Because that can be very annoying if you have a manual gearbox and stuck here in uh, stop and go traffic. And yeah, that's, that's fine as well. You know? I mean, it doesn't need too much power to press the clutch. And so you also won't get annoyed when being in traffic. Of course, we want to show you some more relevant stuff about the car when driving it. So that's it too far for the traffic part, being stuck in traffic, I think. We'll get back to you when it's better going in front of me again. All right, we're back. We'll do some acceleration. That's 80. So that was now five kilometers to 80 kilometers. You see, well, the engine didn't scream too much. Yeah, when we want acceleration, we really have to push the throttle. It's not that fast, but basically everything you need for your everyday driving so that's no problem at all and now we're also going on the motorway and test that one also talking about the assistance systems for example when I'm someone is overtaking me and I'm putting the left turning indicator then I got the, the warning here you know in Germany it's called Toter Winkelwarner interesting word definitely it's a combination word and that's the blind spot warner it works pretty well and this is a safety feature i would definitely recommend you to pick because that can really save you from an accident because sometimes you know you don't really see it in the mirror you don't maybe see it when turning your head and that's maybe exactly the second between that one and then you got the warning this visually and also acoustically so that's a really good thing now 100 kilometers an hour, sixth gear, I can put in the cruise control. RPMs are 2000, 2000 RPMs at 100 kilometers an hour and going fairly straight on that motorway. Now I also hear that the sound insulation is not that good as in other competitors in this car, but still, it's also not, not really bad. Again, as I said, this car is not bad in any perspective, but also not outstanding in, in any perspective. So that's the, the main topic that is repeated on and on again. The steering here at higher speeds, it's quite stable and feels very neutral. And the suspension is more set on the rather soft side, you know, when going a little bit slower in the city, definitely. So when you're going in very fast corners, then you may be lacking some sporty feeling. So that's not a sporty compact car, really more set to the compact. But what is amazing is that when you're going higher speeds on the, on the autobahn, it's not really hindering your success in driving safely. So although the suspension is soft, it's stiff enough for the motorway. So now, um, Getting off the motorway, Let's see how it is in a faster getting out here. And yeah, you see, there is enough stability for the right and left. The car is tilting just a little bit because the suspension is soft. Not really a sporty feeling, not at all. But you also don't feel uncomfortable. And I think they've basically found a good mix here. Where the suspension could be better are some sudden bumps in the road. There it's like this, um, maybe getting a little bit rough sometimes. There we also have experienced better suspensions so far. About this automatic traffic information, I found it in the menu. And it's here it's, by the way, quite easy. If you just go to setup, traffic information, and then switches to off, and that's it. So really easy to do that here, and now I'm not getting surprised by this traffic information. Sometimes, as I said, it can be quite helpful, but especially when you're doing a review, not to scare off some viewers when they're like, traffic information, here it is. <laughs> so I've turned it off now, and yeah, we'll have it silent for the remaining of our review. Now we're getting to a nice countryside part. 
we can also cruise around with the car a little bit more and tell you more about the steering wheel and the steering itself. See, the, the angle where you have to turn the steering and some Nissan cars I have test driven, they need too much steering angle. Yes, it can be helpful in off-road off -road driving, but apart from that, apart from off-road driving, it's really better when you have a rather progressive steering that you don't need such a long steering angle. And when I'm going some left and right and now, you see it's reacting quite directly. Surprised by that. It's just that the suspension is not set on that sporty one, but the steering wheel feels, and the steering itself feels very good and very natural to me. That gives you a rather direct connection to the road, so good in this respect. Definitely. So, I think we have covered a lot of the driving parts. Maybe as a last assistant system, there's also um, a lane, um, a lane keeping assistant. Mainly works on the autobahn and it's not active, so you have got no counter steering. But if you, you know, going over the lines, the marks on the road. Then you also get a small visual warning in the center display and also there's a beeping sound that you know, okay, you're missing that one now. So I'll enjoy some more looks in front of the rather panoramic windscreen, really have to say. And the overview to the sides is also fairly good because we got steep windows. That's it from our driving part with the Nissan Pulsar. And now the auto fuel conclusion with the Nissan Pulsar. They're definitely back in the compact segment and what can you sum up about this car? Basically in the most senses it's not really that good but also not bad at all. So pretty on a standard level. What is astonishing that we got a lot of rear leg space and also the space we have in the trunk or in the boot it's really great. Also, the hatch is opening quite wide. You can put anything in there and therefore, as I said earlier, you can almost use it as an estate, as a wagon, as a combi. And that is the unique selling point from this car. The space in the rear and in the trunk, definitely. Also, the overall package that is very good. Prices in Germany, for example, start at about 18,000 euros. This test vehicle, 24,000 euros with the middle trim and some of the extras and it goes up until let's say 27,000 euros. So here for a quite reasonable price you already get a lot of equipment. That's the second unique selling point with this car. Everything else from driving for example, they are sporty competitors that are not less comfortable at the same time and also the look and feel. That is also better with some of the other competitors we know. We got a lot of other compact cars in our reviews just check them out on our channel, search for them. Almost any compact car on the market, just put it in a YouTube search in connection with Autogefühl and you will surely find a review about that one. I think we've pointed out the very important things with this car and of course we want to hear your opinion on the Nissan Pulsar. Maybe you want to buy one, maybe you already have bought one, then share your experience as well. And I'm sure we see each other at the next Auto Gefühl episode with Thomas. Thanks for watching and bye. And keep supporting us.